confident that we'll get the agreement on the budget. America will not default. You're guaranteed that this right to reproductive health is going to be a main issue in the 2024 elections in North Carolina. Let me just say, the Trump culture of winning is alive and well in Kentucky. Hello, everyone. I'm Major Garrett in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. President Biden says he's, quote, confident about working out a deal with congressional Republicans on raising the debt ceiling. His remarks came a day after he held a second round of talks with those congressional leaders, as you can see, in the Oval Office. Now, they didn't agree on something in that meeting, but the president said afterwards, along with Speaker Kevin McCarthy, that they would name negotiators to work on the process of hammering a deal out. Of course, time is of the essence. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has said default could happen as soon as June 1st. For more on all this, Ed O'Keefe and Scott McFarland join us now. Ed is CBS News' senior White House and political correspondent. Scott, CBS News congressional correspondent. Ed, it matters who's at the table. Who is at the table? Who is the White House appointed to lead these negotiations with the Congressional House Republicans? Names that a lot of people here in Washington know mm -hmm. that a lot of people outside of Washington don't know, and that's by design because they are really the definition of insider. Mm -hmm. Steve Reschetti, who is a longtime uh, consigliere, brain, aide to the president, somebody who really knows his politics, knows him, knows what he's looking for. And knows the politics of the Democratic constituencies in the House and Senate. And, and perhaps even more importantly, especially knows the moderate Democrats mm -hmm. and the Republicans. This is somebody who helped put the Inflation Reduction Act together last year, got Joe Manchin to yes, and is now somebody who Republicans believe they can trust in these negotiations. Another key player also from the White House That's is... Right. Shalanda Young, the budget director, who was perhaps most critically in this negotiation the former staff director or in charge of the House Appropriations Committee, which is the one that writes all the spending bills. So not only does she know how to write them, she also knows how House Democrats are going to tick or click on some of this stuff, given that she very recently worked with a lot of them and, and in essence knows their pressure points, what will be acceptable to most, what won't be, and therefore what's palatable in a negotiation. Scott, so let's clear something up. These are negotiations. The White House has completely lost that article of faith and positioning. These are full-blown negotiations. And with these two heavy hitters from the White House, it signals, at least from my perspective, a sign of respect that Speaker McCarthy has been craving and believes had been denied up until very recently, and that may move things forward. Yes? Not only is it a negotiation now, it has the internal trappings of political theater. The negotiating, the discussions are happening by the parties you just mentioned, backstage where you can't see them behind the curtains but on the stage all the players are still playing their roles there is still the music and there is still the dancing we had house republicans late this morning outside the capitol along with senate republicans reaffirming their ground that there needs to be spending cuts or budget caps for any debt ceiling deal to pass we had democrats out there today, including five U.S. senators late this afternoon saying they want the president to invoke the 14th Amendment to prevent these work requirements for some social safety net programs, to prevent the economy from getting tanked by a debt ceiling increase. So even though there are discussions happening backstage, they haven't emptied the stage out front. The audience still has quite a bit to watch here at the Capitol. And, Ed, to that point, this is pretty typical. You have theatrics and then you have the genuine drama behind the scenes. And as long as the genuine drama behind the scenes is playing itself out, the theater must go on, yep. positions must be taken, poses must be struck until there's something else to discuss. There is. Uh, it's what we call fodder or elements, right? There are plenty of those today if we need them uh, from both sides, including the president who spoke out before he left and it for doesn't Japan. And it doesn't mean that the theatrics are insincere. They're no. sincere for the moment. Right. Uh, and frankly, it's it's meant to keep people uh, on their sides engaged right. and aware of what is acceptable and unacceptable um, and, and allows them to needle both sides while there are people in the back room actually sitting and talking, if not singing Kumbaya, at least figuring out how to get to that song. And so uh, what was so encouraging to Republicans is that the president put those two people mm -hmm. in the room, the budget director and Steve Reschetti, to talk to them because now they realize the president's serious. If he's sending in right. his most trusted advisor... And the woman who's writing the budget and who has worked with House Democrats before, it means those are the people who know how to get a deal. They're backed by the woman, uh, Louisa Terrell, who served as the Legislative Affairs Director for the last two years. So she knows everything as well. Speaker says, good. That's a conversation I want to be having. I don't need 15 people in the room because mm -hmm. you really can only get a deal with a handful. 
Keefe and Scott McFarland, thank you so very much. For more on the debt ceiling, South Dakota Republican Congressman Dusty Johnson joins us now from Capitol Hill. Congressman, it's good to see you. When you were on the takeout a couple of weeks ago, we had a long conversation about work requirements. I know they're a priority for you. Are they a must-have in a debt ceiling deal? Meaning, if they're not in there, Republicans won't vote for it. Oh, I like to avoid talking about red lines because I, don't, I think it's so important that we get a deal so that we can ad avoid default and change the way that this country spends money. So I wouldn't say any one thing is a must-have, but I would tell you the Republican conference highly, highly values work requirements because of the impact they can have in moving people out of poverty. Do they value them more than opening up permitting for energy exploration? Well, I'm not going to publicly, you know, share our our cheat well, sheet go ahead. about really? what it's things all right. we prioritize more highly than others. Yeah, uh, I would say that clearly the Republicans, listen, they they showed their values, their priorities. We passed the limit uh, grow, a limit save grow plan. It's the only plan that has passed any chamber of commerce. Chuck Schumer doesn't have a plan that could pass the Senate. I think negotiations are going to start going better because, as your broadcast mentioned, Rashetti and Shalanda Young have now been appointed by the president. For 97 days, the president ignored Kevin McCarthy. He refused to negotiate. I wish we had those 97 days back now. But since we've got the adults in the room, I think we're going to start to make some progress. The president said today he's confident a deal can be struck. Do you agree? Are you confident? Well, uh, confidence can be misleading in this town. I mean, is there any place in the world that disappoints us more often than Washington, D.C.? I do think, uh, listen, we can't give up. We've got to stay focused. Default is unacceptable. It would be catastrophic. It's not the only crisis we're facing, though. We're also facing $32 trillion in debt. We have got to get that under control. We're going to get this done. Time is running short, though. And when, as he did last week, the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, describes default as psychological, could be a big deal, could be nothing, I gather you disagree with that. Uh, we should not be defaulting. I, I get it. Candidates are going to talk about these issues differently than the people who are on the wall, who need to deliver a victory for the American people. Uh, I forget who said it, but somebody said, you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose. I know prose isn't very catchy. Uh, I know it's not. It doesn't have the same sex appeal as good poetry. But the reality is, uh, listen, we've got to buckle down. We've got to get this work done. Uh, I do wish we had the 97 days back that the president squandered away. But I think in the next 13 days, we're going to deliver good value. I think we're going to have caps on spending, and we need to. I think we're going to put people back to work, and we need to. I think we're going to unlock American energy, and we need to do that, too. Is the discharge petition in the House something you would support and a vehicle to resolve this? I, the discharge petition is, I mean, it's utter balderdash. I, I think it's political theater. It doesn't even ripen under the rules of the House until June 6th or June 7th. We will already be in default by the time that mechanism uh, even comes to fruition. So anybody who's serious, anybody who is a serious legislator who wants to focus on solving the problem needs to do everything they can to make it clear to the President of the United States and the Speaker that we need to get a deal that changes how Washington, D.C. spends money. I think they're getting closer, but any other tactical discussions outside of a deal between the President and the Speaker are counterproductive. Why is it a good idea to refer the George Santos matter to the Ethics Committee? Number one, I would tell you George Santos is a clown. I wish he wasn't here. He's not a serious legislator. If he went away, it would be perfectly fine by me. But I do think we want to keep an eye to how things have been handled in the past here. I mean, that should be a little bit of terra firma if we want the, 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 the future to be fair because it's based on precedent. We have never exposed, we never kicked people out of Congress just because they've been accused of crimes. The Democrats weren't asking for Senator Menendez uh, to resign after he was accused of felonies. We let these things work. Ultimately, I, to me, I, I would be shocked if he wasn't found guilty in a court of law and if he wasn't found liable by the Ethics Committee. When that happens, uh, we will blissfully be rid of George Santos. 
I know you have votes to catch on the other side of the Capitol. Congressman Dusty Johnson, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Abortion restrictions are getting stricter in North Carolina. How the Republican-led state legislature overrode the governor's veto and what it could mean for the state in 2024. You are streaming America Decides. North Carolina's Republican-led legislature has now banned most abortions after 12 weeks of pregnancy. This happened after state lawmakers voting along party lines Tuesday overrode Democratic Governor Roy Cooper's veto of underlying legislation. What that means is now just two states in this surrounding region offer relatively unrestricted access to abortion services. Meanwhile, a federal appeals court today heard arguments in a dispute over the abortion pill mifeprestone, the outcome of that case could impact availability to the drug nationwide. For more on this, CBS News' political correspondent, Caitlin Huey Burns, joins us now from North Carolina. Caitlin, I want to play for you some sound earlier today from Governor Cooper on what the legislature did. Let's take a quick listen. The majority of the people of North Carolina don't want right-wing politicians in the exam room with women and their doctors. And they are mad that this has now become law, particularly women who feel like that they have been slapped in the face in a surprise move, sneaky move, by this legislature. Caitlin, what was sneaky about this move? It was a veto override. It was in full public view, was it not? It was. What Democrats have taken objection to is when the bill originally passed, it did so in 42 hours very quickly. Republicans wanted to move on it. Um, the governor had tried to push at least one Republican to switch votes and vote against overriding the veto, and he wasn't successful in that. We were watching the vote last night, and it happened pretty quickly, uh, first in the Senate and then in the House, and now it will become law as of July 1st. Uh, but we know that this is an issue that has implications beyond North Carolina, because North Carolina had become kind of a central point of abortion access in the South, with most neighboring states either banning or restricting the procedure uh, very severely. Um, so that's kind of where uh, the focus is now, after talking to providers here, is, is what happens next. But Republicans that we've spoken to argue that this was a consensus bill. Take a listen to our conversation earlier today with the House Speaker. North Carolina had been a key access point for abortions in the South. Was your hope that that dynamic would change? So I, I certainly do not want to see us being a destination for that. I, I think we have enough health care challenges in North Carolina taking care of our own citizens where we don't need to be getting spillover uh, from other states unless folks are just here otherwise. So he was acknowledging that they don't want uh, North Carolina to kind of have that status as an uh, abortion access haven. On the other hand, he was arguing that there are exceptions included in this legislation. But as we've been talking about, this is an issue that has become uh, a, a national one on the presidential campaign stage as the Republicans are trying to figure out how to talk about this issue, knowing that it is something proven to help gal have galvanized Democratic voters and independents. Uh, Caitlin, a practical question. Was it discussed there either in the run-up to this veto override or in the conversation about this underlying legislation that whatever the restrictions are, that will not end abortions, and people who try to either have abortions done in their own way or in places that are not clinically sound become health care problems also, meaning the quote-unquote back alley abortions become an issue, healthcare and otherwise, for people within your state or people who travel to your state. That's not going to end. Did that come up in this conversation? 
It came up in the conversation that I had with a provider who we spoke to last year when she was seeing a huge surge in patients from out of states coming to her clinic here in Raleigh. We talked to her again earlier today, and she said that that was her top concern, uh, what this does uh, in terms of care. And she was very concerned of the burden that this would place on hospitals. Um, and so that is something uh, that, that she wanted lawmakers to consider. Coming to us from Raleigh, North Carolina, Caitlin Huey Burns. Thank you so very much. Ahead, Donald Trump says Ron DeSantis, well, his magic is gone. The former president gloated after his endorsed candidate for Kentucky's governor race defeated DeSantis' choice in Tuesday's Republican primary. Could this have an impact on the 2024 race? We'll find out. You're streaming America Decides. Let me just say... The Trump culture of winning is alive and well in Kentucky. Welcome back to America Decides. It was not a good night to be a candidate endorsed by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. In Kentucky's Republican gubernatorial primary, Kelly Kraft, backed by DeSantis, fell to Trump-backed candidate Daniel Cameron. And in the Jacksonville mayor's race, Republican Daniel Davis endorsed by DeSantis, fell to Democrat Donna Deegan. Let's bring in Ashley Etienne and Hogan Gidley. Ashley is a CBS News political contributor. She previously served as communications director for Vice President Kamala Harris. And Hogan Gidley, well, he previously served as White House Deputy Press Secretary in the Trump administration, where I saw him in lower and upper press all the time. Good to see you both. So let's just set something straight here. The former president says that Daniel Cameron is a star, but he's not sufficient to correctly spell his first name. Nevertheless, he endorsed him and Cameron won. But Cameron was a fully fledged Republican in good standing before this race. The Trump endorsement mattered, but he's also part of the McConnell world. He was legal counsel to Mitch McConnell. He lives in both spaces in Kentucky, right, Hogan? Yeah, but only in this town would we be that concerned about the nuances of all of these endorsements. The fact is, the Trump endorsement does carry with it quite a bit of weight, as obvious uh, by the last two wins uh, last night. But the fact is, too, that in the broader scheme of things, what we're looking at here is momentum. And it looks like DeSantis had some for a while. Now Trump has taken that back. He's expanded his lead over DeSantis in the primary. And these types of endorsements just are feathers in the cap for someone getting ready to uh, try and take the nomination. For sure. Ashley, so in Florida last night, there was something that Democrats haven't had much of lately Absolutely. in Florida. A ray of sunshine. A win. <laughs> Not and just the atmospheric, state. but actual political one, <laughs> because everything has been about the obituary for Florida Democrats since DeSantis crushed Chris, uh, Charlie Crist in the gubernatorial race. What happened in Jacksonville? How important is it? Oh, I mean, the win is phenomenal in Jacksonville for the Democratic Party. I mean, it really, to your point, gives us a ray of sunshine and a hope that we can actually play in the state. I met with the president's campaign leaders, many of them I worked with on the last campaign, and they made and they made a point to me, which is there is this narrative that Democrats are running away from Florida. And the reality is they're going to double down in Florida in this next cycle. So I think Jacksonville, the win in Jacksonville, creates a lot of momentum and encouragement that that is the right strategy. So President Biden and the team is going to double down in Florida. They're not walking away from Florida. And again, this race just gives us some great hope. So I want you to look at some video from yesterday at the Oval Office. The vice president was in the meeting with the congressional leaders on the debt ceiling. Explain to us, Ashley, the vice president's role in the reelection and how the White House is reintroducing or reimagining that? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> um, the way that the campaign sort of um, characterized sort of the strategy with the vice president is they were going to reintroduce and recredential the vice president, which I think is really important. As I mentioned to you before, I've worked for the two most powerful women in politics, and recredentialing them constantly is, is necessary because you know, sorry, voters forget. They don't give women credit that they are due. But here's what I think is really important. CBS did a poll that showed that her polling uh, among independent uh, vote, I mean, liberal voters is at 73 percent approval rate and 60 percent among young people. So for me, my, you know, I've seen her spend a lot of time on reproductive rights. I think that's smart. Clearly, the part is double downing on it. You saw the president showed, a, showed up at Emily's List yesterday. So there is a concerted effort to continue to drive the 
the point on abortion rights and the extremism from the Republican Party. But I think that they need to strategically utilize her more effectively with liberals and young voters. That clearly is, is her sweet spot. And it's also shores up the president's negatives, Biden's negatives among young people and among um, liberal Democrats. So I think that's how they that would be my advice to them mm -hmm. about thinking about how to more effectively utilize her to shore up the president. Well, we know they watch this show, so I'm sure you got right to them. <laughs> Hogan, this seems to be like coming up the next four weeks, a pretty important month for the Republican conversation about who the nominee is going to be in 2024. Mike Pence is going to make a decision. Every indication is he's getting in. Yep. Ron DeSantis is going to make a decision. Every indication is he's in and in with both feet. We may hear from John Sununu whether or not that's indicative of something important or not. We don't know. Chris Christie will hear from. And Tim Scott is clearly going to get in. So three right. will definitely get in. It could be as number uh, as high as five, and we'll know that in the next four weeks. Sure. Sum up what's heading for Republican primary and caucus voters in the next four weeks. Well, I'm going to quote someone on your show that probably has never been quoted before, and that is the great philosopher, the nature boy, Ric Flair, the 16-time World Wrestling Federation champion, who said, and I quote, to be the man, you got to beat the man. <laughs> and right now in Republican Genius. politics, Donald Trump is the man. And if he continues to focus on the America First policies that gave him record-setting success and record-setting time for all demographics in this country, I think he's going to be in a really good spot. Someone like Tim Scott is a very interesting character. Obviously, he was my senator. I'm from South Carolina. I know him really well. If the race were held today, most people in the state tell me he'd finish somewhere around fourth. Nikki would be behind him because he just ran a race and he has an apparatus. People like him. He's funny. He's good on the stump. He has good fourth? policies. Trump? Do what? Trump? Trump? Potentially Pence in there, and if DeSantis is in there ahead of Pence, I think yeah. is where it is, where it sits right now. But right now, Trump is ahead in most major polls. And I think someone told me today on the ground who was an operative said Trump already has the state locked up. No one should even come here. Mm -hmm. Again, I would say that's a little far off, knowing the state, but still we'll see. Continuing with the philosopher Ric Flair, is it possible to beat the man? I'm not sure, because the problem is if you attack Donald Trump in a way that hurts him and you take the nomination from him, there will be a large portion of the MAGA base that says, I don't like you for hurting Donald Trump, mm -hmm. and they will stay home and they will not vote for you. That is the problem. I do think a lot of the, the candidates are banking on the calculus that something else will hurt Donald Trump, some legal issue, something else that goes on that will sink his candidacy. I wouldn't bet on that if, if history is any guide, but right now he still is just crushing the field. And does that make Democrats happy, Ashley? Absolutely. Why? I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> well, because I think the, you know, the, the sort of the consensus within the party is that the best organizer and fundraiser for the Democratic Party is Donald Trump. And that best uh, turnout driver. Absolutely. And the, the party's best weapon against Donald Trump is Donald Trump. So I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the Democratic Party wants to run against Donald Trump. The president's currently polling higher than Donald Trump. And if the Republican Party continues to pursue these culture wars, you know, on abortion, for example, like what's happened in North Carolina, it's playing right into the hands of the Democratic Party. Because, you know, again, 73 percent of, of independents want less extremism on this issue. And that's the percentage that makes a difference in those battleground states like North Carolina, right? Some where are, but 11 states who had governors that passed laws limiting abortion won their reelection campaigns. 86% of the people in this country reject the Democrat position. Every single U.S. senator but one voted for a bill that allowed for abortion for any reason, any time, up until the moment of birth, and they wanted you, the taxpayer, to pay for it. A vast majority of the people reject that, and the Republicans do a bad job having that conversation. We were the dog that caught the car in Roe v. Wade, and they shut up about abortion for months and allowed Democrats to paint us with this broad brush. We have to get in that fight and engage in it and try and win back some of those voters to explain what happened, because when Roe v. Wade was overturned, 68 percent of people in this country believed it meant no more abortion for anybody, which, of course, is the best misinformation and disinformation <laughs> campaign I have seen in my lifetime. But we have references thing, to Ric Flair, <laughs> dogs, and bumpers. Can I just to be continued. Okay. Ashley, yeah. I got to run. Right, Ashley perfect. Etienne and Hogan Higgidley, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. That does it for today. I bet you already knew this, but I'll let you know anyway. You can stream America Decides Monday to Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Here's something else you know. You're streaming CBS News.